I was just listening to that scripture reading. And I was blessed. How about you? I heard the variety of voices. And I listened to the message. What an incredible recording. The day of Pentecost. An amazing story. How the Spirit of God fell. How thousands of lives were transformed as a result. And we look back to that and we say, would it not be amazing if the same thing could happen here today? So we're going to go to the day of Pentecost and take a little different direction in just a moment or two. But I want to take you to the day before the day of Pentecost. Okay? The day before looks something like this. The early church, the day before the recording of the day of Pentecost, was in a terrible mess. You don't hear very much about that time span from the crucifixion to the day of Pentecost. Where were they on the day of uh, the day of his crucifixion. They weren't at the cross, the disciples. They were hiding, cowering, wondering if they were going to find out that they were Christians. Not too much happening. And the day after, I don't think it's too far a stretch to realize that their hopes and dreams of a Messiah were pretty well shattered as they took Jesus from the cross and buried him. Where is their leader as he laid in the tomb? Word quickly followed of his resurrection, but unsure of where all of this go would go caused quite a puzzlement in their minds and in their lives and in their hearts. The Christian walk is kind of like that at different times, isn't it? Life is sometimes like a puzzle. Okay, there's a few of you who may not know what a puzzle is. How many of you have ever put together a puzzle? Yes, most of you. Most of you in the congregation have. You are the generation before there were 245 channels and Facebook and everything else. The long winter nights, you would break out a puzzle, and it might have 100 pieces or 200 pieces. I had the occasion to walk into the home, and there on the table was the beginning of a puzzle of 2,000 pieces. 2,000 pieces. Now, I like the bigger pieces. The puzzle would go together quickly. Give me 8 or 10 or 20 or 50 as a kid, and I was fine. And I could put them together rather quickly. 2,000 little tiny pieces with not too much color variation. But to my amazement, the outer border of this 2,000 piece puzzle was already taking shape. But I have a guess, and it's a guess at that, that that puzzle was not going to go together very quickly that it would not be resolved or solved in a few minutes or a few hours or that day, but probably over the continuance of several times coming back to it. In time, its full picture would be made known. But gathering only one little piece of the puzzle would cause the one that was trying to solve the puzzle a bit of bewilderment until that piece would be placed alongside another piece, alongside another piece, alongside another piece. And as the picture started to grow and take shape, you would see the beauty and the amazement of not the first piece being placed, but the last piece of the puzzle going together. Is your life 
sometimes like that puzzle where God gives you just one piece at a time. You wonder what tomorrow holds. It works something like this, the puzzle of life. Where do I fit in the grander scheme of my family life? Who should I marry? What classes should I enroll in? How do I adjust to the empty nest, empty nest syndrome? What do I do when things are not going well at work? Or perhaps, where is my next work to be found? How do I work through some of the issues of life that so, so frequently come into our lives through no invitation of our own, but are, are just forced upon us? Have you been there, friends? Perhaps you're there today. If you are, there's good news from Acts chapter 2. But it's not necessarily the good news that is so readily apparent. As you read Acts chapter 2, we classically view it as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues, and 3,000 being baptized in one day. I think in so doing, it is true all of those things that happened. All of those things happened. But I want to nuance it a little bit from a little different angle today. Because I believe in Acts chapter 2, we find there the story of the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 8, I'd invite you to open your scriptures to that. They were gathered in Jerusalem, men of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together. They were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? It was indeed an incredible miracle. But I want to look at that because it was real fuzzy at first. How is it there are 3,000 people, over 3,000 people gathered from all these different dialects, all these different cultures? How is the message of God going to go forward? Humanly impossible. But beyond the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and knowing the end, I want to zero in in verse 8. And how hear we every man in his own language. I believe the greatest gift, the greatest gift in Acts chapter 2 starts with the gift of God listening to his disciples. Because nothing, nothing ever happens by accident. His disciples call out. And if God was too busy, if God didn't care, Nothing would have happened that day. Can you say amen? Nothing happens except that God listens to our prayers and willingly gives ear to them. And in the puzzlement of life, where do we go? Who do we turn to in our deepest hour of need when all the confusion and all of life presses in and there is no ready Answer, I believe Acts chapter 2 teaches us fundamentally that God hears and answers the desires of our heart. Not readily apparent at first reading in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit gave utterance. The Spirit heard their need and took that knee before the throne of grace. And God answered their prayer. What is it? What is that, that, given, uh, that giving of that language so that everyone heard according to the difference of the tongues and the cultures? 
How is it today as we interact with others that the Spirit can give us the listening that God gives to us? The first and greatest gift that God gives to us is the gift of His listening to our hearts. Do you believe that, friends? It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what the issue of life is that's pressing in upon you. You can go try to solve it. You can try to figure out that puzzle. You may think it's going to go this way. But as God listens to the desire of your heart, He gives you His Holy Spirit and His understanding and brings to you resolution to life's issues in ways that you don't perceive just now. Now, I don't believe it's by accident that God gave to them the gift of languages, but I want to suggest to you that by extension, just as God listened to the needs of his disciples, if we are going to be effective in reaching the hearts of others who speak a language other than which we do, who live in a culture other than which we live into, by extension, we must first listen to them. Does that make sense? Are you following me? Before you can get to the issue of the language to connect with them, we must listen as God listened. Listening is hard. Talking is easy. That's coming from a preacher. It is so easy to talk and issue platitudes. I can so easily talk to my wife. I find it much better when I listen to her. Is it easier to talk or easier to listen? Hmm. What does God want us to do? Does he want us to just talk to him and advise him of our needs? Which parenthetically, he already knows. So it's kind of a crazy conversation when we're telling God what we need because he already knows, doesn't he? But he says, be, what's the next word from our call to worship? Be still and know that I am God. Before the action comes the stillness in the confusion and the perplexity of life. When life is out of focus and we're trying to get it back into focus, we can run to God and say, God, I've got this plan. Please provide so that my plan can be carried out. Or we can go to God and say, wait a minute, just still my soul. So I have the quietness, God, and speak to me. Because before me, there's a thousand different pieces to this puzzle, or six, and I'm thinking of this way, and that way, but I need to hear from you, God, and I need to hear from you soon. And I believe, friends, I believe that he is prompt in giving us an answer. Do you find that to be the case? Sometimes it's not immediate. Sometimes he leaves us in that space of a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit lack of clarity. But as we stay in that space of stillness, quietness, and listening for the voice of God, I believe it's in the stillness that we hear what is called that still, small voice that is so often drowned out by the desires of our heart, by the comments of others, by the press of life as it comes crowding in. So as we think of God speaking to us, how can we know it's the voice of God? How can we understand the culture of another unless we listen to them and understand their needs? There are some universal pieces to language 
uh, languages and cultures that are very easy. There's something about uh, there's something about music that transcends culture. Do you believe that, friends? You can you can uh, you can sing a tune that people will recognize, regardless of the language in which you are singing it in. How about the universal language of food? Sit down with somebody, serve them a good meal. Food. You understand each other? Don't have to say a word. Just partake of a meal. How about the universal understanding of a smile? A simple smile at the right time. A touch, a handshake, a hug, an empathy, a gentleness of caring, an expression of love. Not dependent on language, not dependent on understanding all of the cultural nuances, but a heart that's open that the Spirit of God can flow through us to the very best of our abilities into somebody else's life. And it's that spirit that softens and transforms first our lives that we can enter into the space and complexity of another's life. So love listens before it speaks. Just listen. Just listen. Just listen. Listening, it takes a little bit of skill to learn to listen. Be still and know that I am God. Listening is kind of like, when two people are involved, kind of like two drivers that want to drive the car at the same time. Never happens in your, in your house, only happens in my house. My wife will say, I want to drive. Now, she's a city driver. By that I mean, when she's in a hurry in the city, she wants to go as fast as she can from the stoplight to get up to speed. I mean, not just gradually. She's zero to 60, and a block and a half later, she's deaccelerating 60 to zero. Mind you, she's in a hurry. I'm not sure why, because you're not going to get that, that much, you're not going to get there that much faster rather than traveling at whatever speed is typical. But cars were made to go and cars were made to stop, and let's do that on a frequent, on a frequent basis. So, Oftentimes she says, let me drive, because I don't drive as fast as her in, in the city. We get there about the same time, but she enjoys the ride much better when she's able to get there in a hurry to the next light. The struggle is, you've already figured it out, we both can't drive at the same time, right? You can ask her who usually drives. We'll leave a little mystery. And it works that way similar when we're having a conversation. You can speak or you can listen. But it's hard to do both at the same time. So before we speak, we must listen first to the Spirit of God, then to the Spirit in the other person's heart in life. And then the Spirit of God can impress upon us, just as he did on the day of Pentecost, how to minister to another person. So, does God hear and answer our prayers? Does the voice of God, does God listen as we communicate with him? I'm going to share with you several scriptures. You may want to jot them down. Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 19. God does hear and answer our prayers. Hebrews 10, verse 19 and 20. By communicating, by talking and listening with God, He talks, we listen. We talk, He listens. God loves us so much that He sent Jesus to take our place and die for our sins. He did that so we could once again have fellowship with him. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, we see that we can have access to the very presence of God. Having boldness, Hebrews said, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new in living way. Did you catch that? Wait a minute. 
When we ask Christ something, we enter into the very presence of our Heavenly Father. Not picking up the phone and calling a neighbor, calling the governor, calling the White House, calling somebody important. But coming into the very throne room of God. If there's some place I want to go when life is confusing and complexing and I don't have an answer, that's where I want to go. How about you? Why do we wander around? Why do we go down this maze and that maze and try to figure it out? when we can go directly to the throne room of God through prayer? Does it give sharper clarity to the way that Christians live? Does it give sharper assurance to know that the Spirit of God takes our prayers to our Heavenly Father and places them before His throne? I believe the message of Acts chapter 2 is that very message. As we pray, God's Spirit listens. As we pray, it is God's desire to fulfill His plans for our life. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, The Lord makes clear His His intentions for you and I. For I know the thoughts that I have toward them, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a... Come on, you're good Bible students. To give you a future... And a hope. So that's God's design for our lives. When the way is a little muddy, a little confusing, you may be like the disciples. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You're not a seer. You can't forecast that. But what we do know and we have the full assurance is God is here with us in the present. And He has a plan, a future, and a hope for each one of you here today. And I believe it's a greater plan than you can even begin to imagine today. Do you believe that, friends? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can already hear the tapes rolling in your mind. Maybe he does for the pastor. Maybe he does for the person sitting next to me. But he doesn't know about my past and my background and what I've done and what I don't know and what I want to do, all of which are not in harmony with God's plan. Because I get so confused and I haven't got all the knowledge base of Scripture. Let me tell you, friends, those are thoughts and plans, but they're not of God. We play those tapes in our minds, don't we? We can't because. I'm here to tell you, you can because. You can because God wants you to and the Spirit lives and works in your life. Can you say amen? Amen. There is no reason that you cannot carry out what the Spirit of God impresses you what to do. It's only our own human limitations. We often look this far in front of us and we taper off the expectations that God might have in our lives. And I believe God wants by His Spirit to take our view This way, not this way. To take our view and look up and see that His Spirit is with us today as much as at the day of Pentecost. Can you say amen? So let me ask you today, friends, what do you think it is? In your wildest imaginations that God would have you to be and to do today. Hmm. The quietness is not because I've run out of thoughts. The quietness is to, in the stillness, ask the Holy Spirit to lift our thoughts heavenward. In the stillness and quietness of this next week, Let me touch. Uh, The question often comes as you read Acts chapter chapter 2, how do I know what the voice of God is, where it is, and how can I discern between human wisdom and the voice of God? I'm just, just going to give you the reference and hit on just a few thoughts, and then we're going to close. 
How do we know if we're following by faith, the voice of God, or our own human reason? First, the voice of God speaks in harmony and agreement with Scripture. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is good for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped in every good work. When you're, when you're in that still, small, listening for that still, small voice in that quiet space, open up the scripture and say, what am I learning? Is it in harmony with the scripture? Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, for it's the Holy Spirit that will write upon our hearts, the scripture says in Hebrews 8, 10 through 11, his laws and his covenant in our mind, and where? In our hearts. So we have an intellectual understanding, and in our heart, the place of our emotions. It motivates us to be more like Jesus. The voice of God speaking to us will be in harmony with the Scripture, will be in harmony with the Holy Spirit. It will be in harmony with the knowledge that we have in the Word of Wisdom that comes to us through godly counsel. Where, there, where no counsel is, the people fall. The scripture says in Proverbs eleven fourteen. but in the multitude of counselors, there is what? Safety. So if you're not sure, gather with you some people that you know to be good Bible students and say, hey, you got a couple minutes? I just want to, I want your opinion about something. I'm not asking you to tell me what's right or wrong, but I want your feedback. It works something like this. I'm dealing with this, and I understand Scripture this way. How do you understand Scripture in light of this particular matter? Have you ever found that when you've done that with two or three or four people, you have better clarity and insight in the resolution of the matter you're dealing with? Maybe you haven't done that. But God does speak through godly counsel. And in the confirmation of two or three uh, witnesses, Matthew says, there might be confirmation. The peace of God will come into our hearts and lives. Colossians says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts and in your lives, to which indeed you are called to be one God, uh, one body, Colossians 3, 15. And it's through circumstance in timing. So we find, we find in Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was an outpouring to allow the disciples to speak with cultural uh, sensitivity to multiple cultures. It was a gift of language, but it was a gift of listening to the Holy Spirit and communicating what they heard to others. It was preceded by the art of listening. Listening changes things. Not listening changes nothing. Life is a puzzle, and part of the answer to the puzzle is to listen. To listen, to learn. Ellen White says, that still small voice is applicable today. Today, she says, if you'll hear my voice, harden not your hearts. Conscience, conscience is the voice of God heard amid the conflict of human passions. When it is resisted, the Spirit of God is grieved. So when we see the Spirit of God working in Acts chapter 2, what was the result? The message went out. What was the message? What? Twofold. In Acts chapter 2, there's three questions asked. What do these men speak? Are they drunk? Talking in tongues, it's too early in the day for that. And eventually the question is asked, what then shall we do? And the message was what? Repent and be baptized. What happens in your life when you think about the Holy Spirit and think about God, when you spend extended periods of time quite often he takes us to, a, first, a place of peace. You know when it's puzzling, you're in a state like this, which way is it going to go? 
And then there comes that place of peace. And then there comes that place of reflection. And that place of reflection takes us to the place of repentance. Because I don't know of a perfect person in this room, bar none. But that all of us have corners or issues in our life that we need, we need to ask God's help in growing, that we might more fully reflect the character of God. Maybe it was that unkind word. Maybe that was unspoken word of encouragement. Maybe it was intentional. Maybe it was accidental. It doesn't matter how or why. What matters is, as the Spirit of God speaks to you, give ear to it, because it will call to your consciousness those pieces. And when you yield, you will have a closer, more intimate relationship with Christ. Repent and be... What does it say? Repent and be... Baptized, be cleansed, start a newness with Christ. You, many of you have been baptized, coming forth out of the watery grave in newness of life. What a joy. What a joy that he still listens. So the challenge is this. Today, if you will hear his voice, I'm going to share a piece from Ellen White as we close. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Conscience is the voice of God, heard amid the conflicting human passions. When it is resisted, the Spirit of God is grieved. Men have the power to quench the Spirit of God. The power of choosing is left with them. They are allowed freedom of action. They may be obedient through the name and grace of our Redeemer, or they may choose disobedience and realize the consequences. The Lord requires us to obey the voice of duty when there are other voices all around us urging us to an opposite course of action. It requires earnest attention from us to distinguish the voice of God which speaks from God. We must resist and conquer inclination and obey conscience without parleying or compromise, lest its promptings cease and will and impulse control. The word of the Lord comes to us, all who have not resisted his spirit by determining not to hear and obey. This voice is heard in warnings, counsels, and reproof. It is the message of light to his people. If we wait for louder cries or better opportunities, the light may be withdrawn and we may be left in darkness. The pleading of the Spirit, the pleading of the Spirit neglected today because of pleasure or inclina inclination leads in an opposite direction, may be powerless to convince or impress us tomorrow to improve opportunities today. If we would feel that in every high place we are servants of the Most High, we would be more circumspect. Our whole life would possess to us a meaning and sacredness which earthly, earth, earthly honors can never give. For the thoughts of the heart, the words of the lips, the very act of life, will make our character more worthy in the presence of God is continually felt. And then she concludes with this, let the language of the heart below God is here. Then the life will be pure, the character unspotted, and the soul continually uplifted to the Lord. So ours is not so much to speak or hurry up and go out and do, but ours is to listen and be still 
to the voice of God, that we might be used by him to pour his spirit into the hearts and lives of others as he pours his spirit into our heart and into our lives. May God grant us the blessing of his spirit through Christ. Amen.